Why we love the Tang Dynasty, exploring the unique charm of what's seen by many as the greatest imperial dynasty in Chinese history. Episode 8 The Importance of Migrants. In this episode, we'll learn how the Tang Dynasty not only attracted people from countries far and wide to settle, but also how the dynasty drew on those countries for ideas, commodities, and friendship. I'm Bob Jones, and in this podcast series, we'll be getting to know the Tang Dynasty and attempting to discover how, at its height, it became possibly the most powerful, interconnected, and innovative country in the world with a rich and influential legacy that survives even to this day. There are some who make comparisons between the Tang Dynasty and the United States, and the similarities between the Tang capital Chang'an and New York. But what can they mean? It probably makes more sense to make a comparison with the United States at a certain point in its history. From about 1800 onwards, thanks to huge migration, the population of the United States grew at a phenomenal rate. The result was massive economic growth and cultural diversity with newcomers arriving from all over the world to seek their fortune and begin a new life. New York was the main point of entry on the East Coast and because of that was especially ethnically and culturally diverse. And that's where the similarity comes in. The massive development of trade during the Tang Dynasty provided a route out for goods, but crucially also a way and a reason for people to come in. Li Shimin, Emperor Taizong of Tang, once said, Since ancient times, China has been noble. I love each and all as one, so all of them depend on me as I, my parents. His words signal an important change. From an empire dominated by wealthy and influential clans, sometimes at odds with the state, to one which was open to all, reaching out in a harmonious way well beyond its national boundaries, envisaging a common bond and a universality of aim. So how did this play out in practice? There were several very good reasons why people came to live in the empire. Firstly, they could. Foreigners were allowed to come into the empire, live and trade freely. Now, of course, some were forced to move. Some came because they wanted to, and others came to the Tang Empire for protection. Many tombs have been discovered, showing their owners' surnames to be An, Kang, Mi, He, Shi, and Cao, all of which can trace their origins to the Central Asian region. They came, and they were welcomed. There is one famous example during the time of Emperor Gaozong of Tang. There was a Persian prince named Belus, whose country was overrun and destroyed by Arab forces. So he fled to Chang'an in search of help, where he was made an official and a general. Others followed in the hope that the Tang would help them regain their lost homelands. Once in Chang'an, they were given their own areas to live, and even helped to become self-sufficient. And that's another important reason why people came. They were accepted even to the point that they were allowed to participate in politics. In some places, they even accounted for up to a tenth of the official jobs, and one, a businessman from Samarkand in today's Uzbekistan, rose to become Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs. The dynasty clearly adopted a trusting attitude towards foreigners, but remember, it was built on aptitude rather than status. If a foreigner had skills that they could use, then they were welcomed with open arms.
foreigners were sometimes also absorbed into the Tang military. There are epitaphs to famous soldiers, Ashina Shia, Ashina Chung, and Ashina Simo, all of whom were Turks who served as generals in the army of the Tang. During the time of Emperor Xuanzong of the Tang dynasty, 32 foreign generals played a part in the defense of the realm. Crucially, any foreigners that came were also regarded as equal in the eyes of the law. If a foreigner carried out a criminal act on Tang soil, then they would face the same penalty as a native of the empire. As we learned in a previous podcast, everyone was equal in the eyes of the law, emperor and peasant, native and newcomer. The Tang dynasty attached great importance to commerce, trade between peoples, and adopted measures to both protect it and encourage it. Not only did it station troops in the western region to protect the safety of merchants, but taxes on trade were kept low. Trade along the Silk Road, though it may be easy today, was arduous and dangerous. Merchants often dared not travel the great distances alone, but instead preferred to travel in caravans of sometimes hundreds of people. Bands of robbers were a major problem. Some merchants went to enormous lengths to hide their most precious cargoes. Some stories tell how merchants would bury their jewels under their own skin, cutting them out only once they had reached their destination. Intermarriage was allowed, even at the highest level, especially where groups of migrants and Han people lived side by side in the same communities. Once again, tombs and epitaphs tell us that some merchants lived in Chang'an for more than 40 years, married, bought a house and land. Even when it was safe for them to leave, many preferred to stay. Foreign monks were allowed to preach. There were no restrictions on the spread of foreign religions. So apart from Buddhism, you might find all manner of belief systems, Zoroastrians from Persia, early Christian Nestorians from Syria, and Manichaeists, who originated in an ancient Persian dynasty. Freedom of thought and discourse was seen as important in the Tang dynasty. The Tang dynasty as we know attracted a wide range of students from abroad. According to some records, at one time there were more than 8,000 overseas students in the empire. Not only did they study in Chang'an, but many also took the imperial exams and stayed on to live in China for many years. They were important because, on one hand, they added their own culture and beliefs to the rich diversity of Tang culture, but also, after returning home, they spread Tang culture more broadly across the world. Perhaps the most important aspect of the Tang dynasty when it comes to migration was that it had all the advances of civilization which made it highly attractive. Material wealth, effective rules and regulations, central authority and military strength and security, religious tolerance, creativity in literature and the arts, leadership in science and technology, and also in fashion. It was the place to be if you were broad-minded, with an inquiring mind, and a willingness to contribute to the wider economy. Without this comparative superiority in so many aspects of politics, economy and culture, then perhaps the Tang could not have achieved such vitality. But it raises a question, which came first? Did the Tang's attractiveness attract migrants to it, or was it simply set up to attract attractiveness? Key once again was the attitude and open-mindedness of the emperor. The founding family of the Tang dynasty, the Lees, originated from the Hu people in the north. Their culture was actually quite close to the Turkic tribes to the west, 
but they had long integrated into China. Emperor Taizong himself, it is said, spoke a language not unlike the Turks, which went a long way to curbing the regression towards the Tang. But the traditions must have been strong. Taizong's eldest son, Cheng Qian, identified strongly with his Turkic heritage. Rather than settle down to learn Confucian theories as his father wanted him to do in preparation for being emperor one day, he preferred to roam the grasslands, live in a tent, would slaughter stolen sheep, cook them in a pot, and then eat them communally. His father disapproved and eventually gave up on his son. He was regarded as unsuitable for such an important role. But what this story shows is the blurred lines between the Tang dynasty and the lands and people that surrounded it. These people gravitated towards Tang, and likewise the people of the Tang would reach out to the lands around for ideas, learning, resources, and friendship. Special thanks go out to San Lien Zhongdu for their help in creating the content for this show. This is Bob Jones. Thanks for listening. Join me again next time.